Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's start our service off in a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here on this morning. That we can praise your holy name. Father, may your Holy Spirit now just come into our hearts. Father, fill us with that understanding of the peace that we now have with you because of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we marvel at that and live lives filled with thankfulness for your goodness, grace, and mercy. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide, disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, and he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and the faithfulness of the belt of his lion. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall die with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mount mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as the signal for the peoples, of him shall all nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This certainly has been a year where peace has been a rare commodity. There have been riots, distrust, disunity, and short tempers all over the, split, all over the place. Despite the tumultuous times, that we have been living in, we draw great comfort in the future that awaits those of us who are in Christ. It is a future where there is no more anger, hatred, and division, a future where even nature itself is at peace with each other. Imagine the lion befriending the lamb and the baby being tickled by a cobra and us not even being frightened out by the cobra. And most significantly, imagine us no longer striving against sin. This morning, may our hearts long for the future with Christ as we remember that Jesus is our peace. Thank you, Lydia, for sharing with us about peace and our second Advent candle. We'll be talking about that this morning in our message, just what it means to have peace and to have peace with God. A few announcements uh, this morning to start off. First off, I want to thank um, the Hoopers and Jenna Beadala for the beautiful flowers behind us in loving memory of Len Beadala, as well as Hugo and Eileen Sirenen. Poinsettia orders are due today. Uh, Susie asked that, that you get those into her today. We also have our um, offering envelopes. Some of those still need to be claimed from the back. You can find out about all the other Christmas events that we have going on uh, in our bulletin. Uh, you can find those, a few of those items due. And also don't forget the 21st, uh, that's when we'll be doing our Christmas caroling as well. 6.30 here if you've got those singing chops. And remember, the more that show up, the less I have to sing. Um, I did, really, like, please. Uh, let's start off by singing now our opening hymn, What Child Is This?
Let us join together now in going before the Lord, confessing to him our sins. I, a poor, miserable sinner, born of the sinful human race, confess unto you, holy and righteous God, that I have not loved you above all things, nor my neighbor as myself. Against your holy will have I transgressed by thought, word, and deed, and have therefore deserved eternal condemnation. But you, Heavenly Father, has promised to forgive those with penitent hearts, and believing in Jesus Christ, seek refuge in your fatherly compassion. Relying upon your promises, I confidently beseech you to be merciful unto me, and to forgive me all my sins, to the praise and glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us. The promise of Scripture is that whoever confesses his sins to the Lord will receive forgiveness through the faithfulness and righteousness of Christ. God grant that this may be the assurance of us all. Amen. So we go to the Lord in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is with Great joy, Lord, as we gather together in your house to worship you this morning and sing praises to you, O God. In this time of, of great distress, Lord, in our nation and with this, uh, the virus going on and uh, the strain on the health care workers and the uh, schools, Lord, uh, to get this all figured out, Lord, we pray that you would just lead and guide them, Lord, uh, Strengthen them, Lord, as they uh, care for those of our loved ones, Lord, who are, are, are suffering right now, Lord. Pray, Lord, that uh, we bring a, a soon end to this. We get our lives back uh, to somewhat normal, that uh, we would be able to um, minister, Lord, uh, in a way that uh, would be uh, much easier, Lord, than that we find right now. Uh, Lord, we pray for the uh, political unrest too, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to just to, just to do a mighty work, Lord, in our nation. Uh, bring us back together, Lord. There's uh, division and there's uh, a lot of uh, stress and strain, Lord, on, on people's lives and our loved ones, Lord, who are shut in. And uh, it's just a very difficult situation now, Lord. We pray for our, our just uh, not only our nation, Lord, but for the world that through all this, Lord, that uh, individuals would come to, to uh, know you, Lord, as their Savior, that they would uh, realize that, uh, that there's more to life than, than what we see, but that you promise uh, eternal life, Lord, to those who trust and put their faith in you. And Lord, help us as a church, Lord, to, to bring that message uh, to those, Lord, who haven't heard, those who need to hear, uh, and that uh, they might find uh, hope in you, Lord, in, in times of what seem to be hopeless. And so, Lord, we pray for our service now. We pray that you would just uh, minister to our hearts. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit as we continue to worship. Be with Pastor, Lord, as he breaks forth the bread of life. And uh, just bless our service, Lord, and bless uh, and every word, every um, uh, worship time, Lord, would, would just glorify and honor your name. And just uh, make these words now, Lord, uh, bless our, our lives too, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are able, if you'd like to rise with me as we turn to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 11, reading verses 6 through 10 of Isaiah chapter 11. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not 
hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This ends our first reading. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Again, reading Jesus' name, starting with verse 18 through 21. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That sends our reading. Let us confess the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not to me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Guy, you may be seated. Let's join together in singing, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day.
Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy and delight it is to come before you today, today together, singing your praises, confessing our sins, but also confessing our faith in knowing that, Father, because of your goodness, your grace, your mercy, that our sins are forgiven and that we can look forward to peace on earth for what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus. Let these words now today, Father, fill us with that understanding of the peace that we now have with you. Let our hearts be filled with an, a joy that we can't even begin to express because of this peace now. God, thank you for the great gift of your Son, Jesus, in whom we hope and trust. Amen. So I always found this story to be one of the most beautiful, inspiring stories maybe recorded in history. I love this story, and I've probably shared it before. If I have, I apologize, but it's just, it's that good, and it's one of those stories, too, that almost brings up the old adage that sometimes truth just can seem stranger than fiction. The story almost sounds so unrealistic that it had it not happened, there's no way you would believe it. But it's about the Christmas truce of 1914. And I'll share with you what uh, the write-up on history.com was really good. I'll share with you what they wrote in this. But the Christmas truce occurred on and around Christmas Day of 1914 when the sounds of rifles firing and shells exploding faded in a number of places along the Western Front during World War I in favor of holiday celebrations. During the unofficial ceasefire, soldiers on both sides of the conflict emerged from the trenches and shared gestures of goodwill. I don't know if you knew this or not, but on December 7th of that year, 1914, Pope Benedict XV had actually suggested a temporary hiatus of war in order to celebrate Christmas. Obviously, the warring countries refused to create any kind of official ceasefire. But on Christmas, the soldiers in the trenches declared their own unofficial truce. And so what happened during that Christmas truce of 1914? Starting on Christmas Eve, Many German and British troops fighting in World War I sang Christmas carols to each other across the lines. And at certain points, the Allied soldiers even heard brass bands joining the Germans in their joyous singing. At the first light of dawn on Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across no man's land, calling out Merry Christmas in their enemy's language. At first, the Allied soldiers feared it was a trick, but then realized the Germans were unarmed, and so they too climbed out of their trenches and shook hands with the enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and sang carols and songs. Some Germans lit Christmas trees around their trenches, and there was even a documented case of soldiers from opposing sides playing a good-natured game of soccer together. German Lieutenant Kurt Zemich recalled how marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. An English officer felt the same way about it, quoted saying, Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. The so-called Christmas truce of 1914 came only five months after the war had started in Europe. Unfortunately, this is one of the last examples of what was even written as an outdated notion of chivalry between enemies in warfare. It has never since been repeated. Future attempts at holiday ceasefires have always been quashed by officers' threats of disciplinary actions. But that event that day served as the heartening proof that however brief, that beneath the brutal clash of weapons, the soldiers' essential humanity endured. During World War I, the soldiers on the Western Front did not expect to celebrate on the battlefield, but even a world war could not destroy the Christmas spirit. Friends, please rise for the reading of our sermon text. Our sermon text today comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This ends our scripture reading. You may be seated. Our text today makes no mention of peace, but yet we're talking about peace. Because our text today describes what it is now that we have peace with God. So we're going to get to our scripture text in a little bit because I want to build up to get an understanding of why peace is such an essential aspect of both Christmas and our Christian faith as a whole. Peace is probably the main thing that we get the most from Jesus' death on the cross and our faith in God. Because we now have peace with God. You see, it starts off as this. We can have peace with God because we have to understand that first off, we are enemies of God. And I know when to say that, you're like, well, I'm not an enemy of God. I'm here this morning. I got up early. It wasn't hard to do. I wouldn't get up for my enemies. You have to understand what it means by this. When Paul wrote in Romans 5.10, he said that while we were enemies, and in there he is referring to our relationship with God, while we were enemies of God. And so again, if you're sitting here, you probably do not think of yourself as an enemy of God. So how can Paul call you that? He doesn't know me. I'm no enemy of God. Well, you listen to what James said in James 4.4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You can't tell me that you haven't made yourself a friend of the world. By this, it means as a friend of the world, anytime you give in to the passions of your flesh, anytime that your pride has ever reared its ugly head and it all has to be about you, anytime you are not supposed to do something, something that you know goes against God's law and you do it anyway, anytime you're supposed to do something and you don't do it. You see, I think we actually like to acknowledge the good things we do in our life so that way we can mask the bad things, the things that make us friends with the world. Because if I focus on my few good things, I can quickly sweep under the rug all the things that make me a friend of the world. I mean, how many times have you made excuses for your character flaws? Well, I can't help it. That's the way that God made me. It's almost like you're blaming God for your flaws. How many times have you tried to justify the bad behavior in yourself, especially if it's towards others? Well, they drove me to it, or they deserved it. How many times have you had an impulse to, to satisfy your own flesh, even though you know it goes against God's law for you, and you think to yourself, well, Jesus will forgive me if I do this, and who? Okay, we do this kind of stuff. We listen to all these little lies that justify it, so now do you start to understand when it says... A friend of the world is an enemy of God, and unless you say none of those apply to me, you fall into this friend of the world. We simply cannot behave in a way that goes against God's character or that goes against what it means to be a child of God and think that God is okay with it. I don't care how many times we want to justify our actions or make excuses for it or even ignore it. Wrong is wrong, sin is sin, and if it's against God, then you are accountable for it. Sometimes we even deceive ourselves and say, well, yeah, fine, I know it's wrong, but that guy's a whole lot worse. Sin cannot be overlooked. It's going to work one of two ways with God. Either, either he overlooks all sin, in which case we cry, well, then where's the justice or he punishes all sin. So get out of the gray area that mine are okay, but theirs aren't. And so that leaves us with a big problem now, and that is we are sinful. And for some really lame reason, we allow ourselves to continue to be sinful. Especially knowing that this makes us enemies of God. 
You see, God's children receive the eternal reward. That's what heirs get. Heirs receive the reward. Enemies and the enemies of God will receive eternal condemnation. So all of a sudden that gets us thinking, well, then how is it we as sinners, thus enemies of God, how are we supposed to be children of God to receive our eternal reward? This is where it's great. This is where Paul goes on to say, though, in Romans 5.10. When he referred to us initially as enemies, he goes on to say something that we can cling to as our hope. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? You see, Jesus didn't just reconcile us to God, but he saved us. It's more than just saying, all right, fine, you guys are okay, but we are now saved because of this. This is the Christmas story, friends. Do you remember what the angel said to Joseph? Matthew 1, 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You realize how essential that statement is, he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to this earth for that purpose, to save us. His children, even though it's our sins. And that's how God is towards us. Instead of disowning us for our rebellion, he comes to die for us so that he can claim us as his. So this is where we go into our scripture text then. We have been claimed as his. We are an heir. So let's get into that now. Galatians chapter 4, verse 3. In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Everything we've been talking about up to this point is that. We are enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. We are enslaved to our flesh with its sins and its desires. And if you do not like to think of yourself as being enslaved to it, you absolutely are. Because all those questions I asked earlier, unless you answered no to those, you are enslaved to sin. Because if you aren't, then why are you still doing them? We can't stop because sin is our master and it controls us. We like to sit there and think we have free will. We're our own masters. I'm free, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it all before. The second Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, we became slaves to sin, and our freedom was lost. All we have done since then is suffer the consequences of sin and death. Remember last week we talked about this. All of nature even cries out in the suffering and bondage of sin, waiting to be freed. Do you realize the life we are living right now is not the life that we are supposed to be living? This is not what God has planned for us. This is not God's design for us. And so then this happened. In order to free us from this life that we are not supposed to have, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, Jesus came into this world, born of Mary. So that made him fully man. God became man. God became one of us. Though he still remained God as well. That's an entirely different sermon on one of the natures of God. God was fully God, fully man. And so as man, he walks this earth, yet he's under the same law that we as people were under. The difference is this law that convicts us of our sins against God, unlike the rest of us, could not convict Jesus. And instead, the law which required that perfect sacrifice for our sins, Jesus, by remaining perfect, became that. So when he died on the cross, it was to redeem us who were under the law. And with that, then, we could receive the adoption as sons. Do you realize what Jesus was doing there? All that he has, all that is his, his eternal kingdom, he is giving to us as well. All who believe in Jesus, who desire to be children of God, he came down to this earth to bring us peace with God 
so that we may inherit the good things of God. That is such an incredible thing to think about, that he came down here, gave his life so that he could give us his kingdom. But you know what part of the problem with that is? I think sometimes we just let the message stop there. We let the gospel message stop there that, yep, Jesus came as a little baby, he died for my sins, I'm all free, and it makes us lazy Christians, because that's good enough. Jesus died for me, so I'm good. Do you really think it stops there? That's all it takes? Because if that's what you do, if that's all it is, you are not getting the fullness of what comes through this text and what comes through a relationship with Christ. Listen again in verse 6. And because you are sons, God has spent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Which means you now have the Holy Spirit in you, compelling you to be more like Christ. God's Spirit in you. And what does it mean then to be more like Christ? Well, how did Christ live? When Christ walked this earth, he lived in full obedience to God, only desiring the things of God, not caught up in the things of this world. So, why do we live different? Why do we not live as if transformed by the spirit that is in us? Why do we allow ourselves to continue to be enslaved by the world? You have it in you. The spirit is in you, calling you to be more like Christ, to seek after the things of God. I mean, the thought alone that we have peace with God because of what he's done for us should be good enough to compel us to be more like God. But then he has the promise of the good things for the children of God. How does that not change us? To know that God is not our enemy, but in fact he is for us. That his ultimate desire is not a single person would perish, but instead that we would all be freed from the enslavement of sin and know that our peace is made with him through faith in Jesus. Our peace with God actually is more than just, okay, God and I, we're cool. You know, we're good now, man. It's deeper than this. Our peace with God is this rich that it says we can now cry, Abba, Father. We can call God our Father. I know we say it a lot around church, yeah, Heavenly Father, this and this. Do you ever stop and realize how big that statement is to call God Father? You know, the one who can speak and galaxies are formed, the one who knows the very measurements of the foundation of this earth, the one who says to the water, you can go this far and you stop there, the one who knows every single lightning bolt that's ever flashed, you can call him Father. That is the type of relationship you have with God. He is not this distant God lording over you, but he desires this relationship to you. He has called you a child of his and made you an heir. An heir. That means the promise of eternal life with him. Verse 7 then. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So this leads us to our final point of what the heir can look forward to. What the heir can look forward to receiving. So if you are viewed as a son, you say to yourself, great, I have that reward waiting for me. Here's what your incredible inheritance looks like. We go back to our Old Testament reading from that because it doesn't get any more beautiful than that. You've already heard it a couple of times, but I want you to hear some of the descriptors again of what you are an heir awaiting. First off, an heir is awaiting this. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. That right there is our ruler. That is Christ ruling. Righteousness and faithfulness. And then it goes more than that. Because what it will look like when you are there under the one who is ruling forever with righteousness and faithfulness, this is what it looks like, verses 6 to 9. And I want you to listen to the details of this again. 
The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do you know what you hear there? Peace. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the young goat, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, the young child won't fear the snake. The lions basically become vegetarians there. Do you realize heaven's going to be full of hipster lions that are going to lecture you on the dangers of eating meat? But you get that, right? All of these examples point to peace. All of these things that on this corrupted earth are things that are at odds with one another, that are war with one another, are suddenly at peace with one another. That means we are freed from the enslavement of sin and its consequences. Because on God's holy mountain where Christ will reign forever, that's how it will be, and we can receive all of this as children of God because that peace is our peace too. God and man are at peace. So think about that. That reward awaits you on the holy mountain. And with that thought, with that peace, comes this, an elimination of stresses and anxieties. All of the broken things of this world that we have to endure daily are no more. No more enemies, nothing to fear anymore, nothing can harm you anymore. And amongst all that peace, we no longer have to fear the wrath of God. Because of the declaration that the angel made to Joseph, he shall come to forgive the people of their sins. What should be our greatest fear, the wrath of God, has been satisfied because of the coming of Jesus and his death on the cross. You wonder why we celebrate Christmas? That's why. Because with the coming of Jesus came peace with God and the hope that can come and endure for the children of God. And that little short text that Paul wrote there in Galatians 4, that's Paul reminding us of why God sent his son into the world. It was God doing this for us. It was God making our relationship that we broke right between us. It was God giving his spirit to us that we can continue to grow in our faith and in being more Christ-like. And so what are you going to do knowing all of this? Knowing the Spirit is in you, calling you to be more of a child of God. Are you going to hang on to the fact that it's hard and it's uncomfortable to transform? I don't want to be this way. I want to hang to these things of the world. Or do you want to say, God, Abba, Father, your Spirit who is in me is transforming me to be more like Christ now. Do you really want to get pulled into all the brokenness of everything or fix yourself and your eyes on the holy mountain of God where things are supposed to be? So I want to close out with this reminder because I get it. The pull of the world and life, it's tiring and it wears us down at times. But I want you to remember this. Galatians 4, 1 and 2. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. You see, as a believer in Christ, you are a child of God. You are no longer an enemy of God. You are a child of God and thus an heir to the kingdom. So this text is talking about you today. But as with an heir, you cannot claim your inheritance until the time is right. Just like there was that appointed time for Christ to come into the world, that he could live and die to free people from their sins, there is an appointed time when Christ will return and reign forever. At that time, everything will be made right. We will have peace with God and we will receive our reward. But until that comes, until that time is here, we have to realize that we need to be waging war with the world, not giving into it. 
which means putting aside all of the lures and trappings of this world, all of the things that are characteristic of the enemies of God, and instead live as filled with the hope of the greater that is to come. It is that hope is how these soldiers were able to lay down their weapons on that day to celebrate the birth of Jesus together. Because they knew that through Christ they had peace with God. And that if we can have peace with God, we can certainly have peace with one another. And instead, let's do that. Let's let our peace with God give us peace with one another to carry one another through these difficult times of life until one day together we can receive our great reward on that holy mount. Please bow your heads to me in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for what you have done for us through your son Jesus and that peace that we now have with you. And through that peace with you, God, we are now sons and heirs to the greater things that are to come. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, then strengthen us every day to keep our eyes focused on that great reward for the children of God. Let us be compelled to live out that peace that we now have with you. That, God, we would not take it for granted, but instead realize how great it is that our peace with you even allows us to call you Father. Let us live then daily as children of yours. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful thing it is to be able to take communion then on a day we talk about the peace that we have with God, this, this visible means then of what Christ gave to us for the forgiveness of sins. And so let's first go to the Lord in saying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup, and when he had eaten, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Friends, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction of all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Friends, let us rise and sing together our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Let us pray. We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. We ask for your infinite mercy. Strengthen our Christian faith. Support us in the trials of life and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now, friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.